Hello everyone, it's Shane Kanto, your Wasteland reviewer. Welcome to Welcome to the Wasteland. And this is my weekly show where I take a deep dive into a particular film. And we have a Best Picture nominee on this week back in 1931. A long way from the other John Ford films I've been watching recently, to be perfectly honest. But joining me this time is my buddy Mike Hilty, who wound up doing all kinds of projects together. So Mike, welcome back. I didn't want to miss a thing for this one. Yeah, you know, this was certainly one that had a lot of sweet emotions going into it. A little bit, a little bit. And okay. one day we'll finally get through all of John Ford and I could dream on to other directors. And I could keep going, but I'm going to end it there. But <laughs> no, it's not that Aerosmith that we're talking about today. <laughs> But for those who haven't tuned in to uh, Welcome to the Wasteland before, we have three segments. We have Coming Attractions, our feature film, and Recommendations. And we're starting with Coming Attractions for the week of November 3rd. Yes, it's November already. And there feels like something is missing. And I feel like it's a dune-sized hole. That mm -hmm. indeed is missing because that's what was supposed to be coming out this weekend. But instead, the big releases are Priscilla from Sofia Coppola, What Happens Later from Meg Ryan, and a few other streaming films coming our way. But Mike, what is the Netflix film opening in limited theaters that you're most excited about? I'm a big fan of Coleman Domingo, so Rustin is my pick for uh, what I'm most excited about. Any chance that I get to prop up Coleman Domingo, I'm going to do it because mm -hmm. I've loved him in most of the stuff that he's been in. I really liked him in Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. I really, really like him in Euphoria. So yeah. when when you told me a little bit about this movie about um, Bayard Rustin, right, the openly gay civil rights activist, um, I, you know, kind of looked it up, kind of read a little bit about it watched a trailer for it and yeah i'm really excited about this one because coleman domingo looks great in it and he you know just give give that man more opportunities to to headline movies because mm. i think he's been grossly underused as as a performer so that one i'm definitely excited about i'm definitely excited about the subject matter as well just any stories that we get that highlights you know anything with civil rights uh, particularly with the LGBTQ community. I'm all for having more movies like that. So mm -hmm. I'm excited to to watch that. Yeah, absolutely. And Coleman Domingo is one of those middle-aged Black character actors that have been doing a lot of great work. And even, oh, uh, what was it? Oh, uh, what was that uh, neon film? Or was it 824 that came out? Um Oh, with Riley Keough and like Z or something like that. That was based off of some kind of like Reddit post of this craziness. Coleman Domingo oh. was great in that. I'm trying to remember what the hell the name of that was. And I'm, Zola. 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 That was it. Zola. He is great in that too. And it's exciting to see him in. Maybe he could slip into that fifth best actor slot with, you know, Killian Murphy, Leo. Probably Joaquin Phoenix and probably Bradley Cooper, uh, mm -hmm. if things go as planned. Yeah. But maybe trying to get some love there. This one's definitely a passion pick for me. And this is actually releasing on Netflix on November 3rd. And that's the new documentary, Sly, about yeah. Sylvester Stallone. So I will certainly be excited to be sitting back and watching some, you know, everybody's uh, favorite Italian actor from. Philly and Rocky Balboa, Sylvester Stallone, and, and I'm sold. I'm excited about it. And is it, watch. is it just going through his his whole life, just kind of start to finish, or are they kind of focusing on, on a particular period in his life? That is a good question. The So this is kind of like a follow-up to what they did with Arnold. Mm, Except okay. this is just going to be a singular film instead of a three-part mini series like right. that one. 
But yeah, it's looking over his 50 years of working in film, so... I, I guess Academy Award winner St- Sylvester Stallone doesn't warrant three parts, whereas, you know... <laughs> Arnold! <laughs> well, I don't think Sylvester Stallone turned into a politician where they could have a whole entire episode just about his political career. So... I don't know, but you know what? I'm excited about it. And you know, they were friend they're frenemies, they're good friends now. So Mm -hmm. they're they're all happy about it. But yeah, Yeah. there's some interesting choice, there's some interesting stuff to check out this week, just not Dune, sadly. Um, we have to wait a few more months at least for that. But time to get into our feature film of the week, which is Aerosmith from 1931, of course, directed by John Ford. And here's some background. This was indeed a pre-code film. Certainly dealt with some darker stuff, which we'll talk about. Yes, very much so. Um, Ronald Coleman and Helen Hayes are two leads. This is based off of the 1925 Sinclair Lewis novel. This is very loosely based, though, not very close to the novel. This does leave out a lot of the womanizing that Dr. Aerosmith was very well known for and only vaguely alludes to the fact that he totally had a side piece in this movie. Yes. Uh, at least for a part of it. And this was nominated for four Oscars. Best Picture, Adapted Screenplay, Cinematography, and Art Direction. Certainly we'll be getting to the cinematography at one point. But, Mike, what are your general thoughts on Aerosmith? This is a really fascinating story. And not only that, It's weird to pick this when we're kind of just on the very much on the tail end of a pandemic right now. So Mm, it's it just felt like a very timely movie to watch, especially all the parts where they're actually talking about the experiment Mm -hmm. with, you know, like, hey, are we going to vaccinate all of these people? Are we only going to vaccinate half of them? You know, that's you're you're not going to find that now in that same way Mm because that just kind of breaches a whole lot of ethical things that i just don't think are going to be done now because you know we that stuff matters now where where you're doing things in an ethical way and you know just having that type of compassion but it was a really interesting story i'm very surprised to hear that the this is this was a loose adaptation of the novel because the the whole womanizing thing that would completely change the tenor of not only this movie but it also completely changes the tenor of that last part where it's heavily implied that he hooked up with that with that other person the daughter of a plantation owner yeah yeah it just in the west indies and it just it because that part just felt like it came out of nowhere Because he, because it even says in the beginning of the movie, it's like, this is a story about, you know, a doctor who gave his all and then his heart belonged to one woman. It's like, oh, okay. Well, maybe something else belonged to another briefly. Um, (laughs) But like, yeah, that's the, that's the interesting thing about is because they, I feel like they Clint Eastwood this, where it's just like, you know, the rougher parts of the story aren't really important and kind of just like buffed it out, which also this is a pre-code film. So they could have easily gotten away with him, like sleeping around with a whole bunch of women and stuff like that. But like, I guess they did really want to focus on his marriage, the motivation there, and then the, like his actual work. Yeah. And one of the things that actually, speaking of his marriage, what a rushed like falling in love it's like hey you mopping the floors i just got punished i'm oversharing Mm -hmm. i'm in love with you and i don't think i could love anybody else and i'm just like well that's a record Uh, yeah that's so quite quite a quite a love story there where he pretty much they they meet they talk for like a couple seconds and then all of a sudden he's asking her out on a date like oh which like what a, what a time to be alive the right? date part i'm like okay whatever but like he's just being aggressive but like at said date where he's like i don't think i could ever love another woman i'm like yikes okay wow this was indeed the 1930s um mm-hmm. it's like at this point it's just like okay 
moving fast here. But the thing is, Hayes and Coleman, I think, had really good chemistry. So then I bought into their marriage once, like, it got to that point. But that felt so rushed to me. Um, but like you said, such a big part of this is looking into the into healthcare and medicine. And really, yeah, the the gray morality of that deep scientific method of being at distance and being like, well, to prove this works, we're going to have to like endanger some people. Yeah. And that's the unethical dilemma, uh, the ethical dilemma of true scientific method and experimentation where it's like, you have to have a placebo. You have to have a control group. That's how experiments work. But these are human beings. I was just about to say that. Most of the time, those placebo groups are rats or hamsters or yep. something to that effect. But it's not humans because we have rules about mm -hmm. that. And also, given the stakes of the situation as well, she's being dropped into a hot zone as well for the plague. Of all yes. things, the plague. Not just some like strain of the flu that is, you know, roughing things up. No, the plague. So you better get this right. But mm -hmm. not only that, from a scientific standpoint, just the competitive drive that Aerosmith has in order to be a successful doctor, he risks a lot for a lot of, you know, just to be successful, where he moves from where he's at originally in the movie to yep. to South Dakota to start up a practice runs into some trouble because he tries to cure cows. Yeah. Which that I, I found that part pretty strange, but also at the same time for someone who just is driven by science and driven to experiment and, you know, to, to help and to cure things. Yeah. That makes sense even gets into a little bit of a tussle with the local the local vet party who is just like no 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 this is this is my territory and then moving to new york so that he could join this institute so that he can you know just better his career through research and then mm -hmm. when he finally is onto something he gets undercut and gets somebody publish publishes something first so his ambition just ultimately just gets the best of him because at the end he ends up losing the thing that quote unquote is the most important thing to him because he cared more about you know setting aside that he cared more about the side piece that he kind of had but he just he wanted to help as many people yeah. as he could uh in that time and it ended up costing him everything it cost him his wife and that that was a devastating scene of him coming back to find her dead after all that. And yeah, he goes on this roller coaster ride of a career of compromising on what he really wants to do, coming into conflict no matter where he goes. And then on top of that, it felt like the scene from Robin Hood Men in Tights, where it's like, Where's my father? Oh, he died. It's like, Papa died. And it's like, Mother died after papa and it just kept, keeps going and everybody because it's like his wife dies and then he comes back and his mentor has a stroke mm -hmm. and it's just like what and it's just like this guy literally loses the two people that mean the most to him in life mm -hmm. and it's so fascinating that like by the end he's just like no get rid of all of this i'm going out into the wilderness and i'm doing research and dedicating my life to science by side piece who randomly yeah. pops up to be like i want you and he's just like no 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 my career no i i need to focus on that because even even before those two you've got the the doctor that he that brought him to that area he mm -hmm. he dies while they're talking oh, yeah. on the phone which also and, like and you're dealing with the plague yeah, you're giving everybody these shots, and then you're surprised that you get sick. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which yeah, yeah, that's the thing. His his mentor there dies, his wife dies, his mentor at home dies, 
And it's just this devastating emotional roller coaster. And just him winding up getting to the place where he needs to be at the end, where he realizes that, like, he has to put his work above everything else because he needs to be able to save as many people as possible. Because I don't think he could afford to lose anybody else. There's and, no one there's no one else to lose besides exactly. the side piece, potentially. He's lost literally everybody else. And so he puts that distance, focuses on his career, and hopefully can make a difference in terms of medicine. And it's such an interesting journey that he winds up going on in this film, this globe-trotting film filled with emotional impact, uh, very subtly alluding to he had this affair. He 100% had the affair, but like mechanically oh. from a filmmaking perspective and storytelling like him right outside her door him like taking his clothes off slowly and then in 1931 fashion like yeah they did it oh yeah but then as soon as he gets off the phone with the 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 dr marshawn yep. just again just kills over when he's when they're on the phone together the look that they gave each other is like yeah we did that. Both of them in robes, both just give each other just the slightest of like the only thing missing from that scene was a wink. Be like, yeah, that we we did that. But I I do ever so slightly like that there is a little bit of ambiguity there because there it kind of does preserve the fact that you know him and uh, and his wife, they did love each other yes. a lot. And I think there eventually will be a tremendous amount of guilt for him because she, he, I'd like to think that she knew that she was super uncomfortable being there and she was very uneasy, particularly when like when they actually arrived. So mm -hmm. for him Which, to like, come back. And you have that whole entire sequence where she forces herself onto the boat. She gets a ticket she invites herself on this journey where he obviously did not want to put her into danger, but he lets it happen. And then there's that added level of uh, grief and responsibility and regret. And this film really packs a punch. And some other things I want to, uh, this got art direction, that art deco, like whenever they're in the city, just like chef's kiss of production design, the camera work is really impressive and that's certainly a hallmark of early john ford so far and that camera work that like felt like this point of view shot of them landing at the village on the boat and everything yes really like brings you into the situation and then the last scene we see with his wife the smoking her in that chair the strands of light on the wall i'm just like well that's beautiful beautiful and then the the one shot of the smoke coming up from her cigarette and everything i'm just like yep not surprised it's got cinematography oscar nomination because they went hard absolutely but this is like probably this, my number two john ford film so far that i've mm -hmm. watched at this point i've i'm up to 22 of uh, these films that i've gotten through this and four sons are the two mm -hmm. that really feel like full-fledged films that are really fleshed out really deliver and i was pretty impressed by this especially for like an early best picture nominee yeah for sure this did pretty darn well for itself mm -hmm. i agree now mike do you have anything else that you want to add about aerosmith there's you know i kind of took some notes about a lot of the scenes that i thought really stood out to mm -hmm. me and some of the things that kind of stood out were you have the first meeting when Dr. Gottlieb and Aerosmith first meet when he's still a student. Mm -hmm. Just the way that it's framed, it kind of just feels like Gottlieb is so much bigger than mm -hmm. Aerosmith and that he's actually looking up, which very symbolic in a lot of ways. But I thought that scene was really cool. The scene where Aerosmith first meets uh, Leora, you know, just in that hallway she's scrubbing it's just a really wide shot um i thought that part was really cool um there's there's a lot of different scenes in this that plays with the lighting and the shadows 
Uh, and there's one scene in particular where he's experimenting in the kitchen and you could see like the, the smoke from a lot of his, um, you know, just a lot of his experiments just kind of coming up uh, in the yeah. shadows. I, I thought that part was really cool. The scene with the rat as it's going onto the ship. Um, it's like, oh, okay, well, we all know where this is going because they talked about this beforehand uh, mm -hmm. that, you know, everything with the plague. Uh, you mentioned two of the shots that I, I really liked when Aerosmith is rowing to the colony uh, that's most infected and then when she's smoking the cigarette and then the part where he is bringing or where Aerosmith brings Leora back to the bed after he's discovered that she's died and just it's really dark obviously symbolic of how he's feeling about the whole situation um i just i thought that was a really cool and effective shot and then i guess the last one will be when Aerosmith he's he's drunk after after she dies he's he knows that he's just lost the most important thing to him i guess and then the part where he says okay everybody just gets the serum i don't care let's just save as many people as we can and the shot of all these people just like rushing in to this yeah. room to try to get this serum i thought that was a really well done shot and it's, a, it's just a cool overhead mm -hmm. shot of that because you know you it could have just kind of stayed within the point of view where everything's just kind of looking straight at the door but it kind of just shows just how dire the situation is and that's a great choice to have it overhead versus not so Absolutely. those those were those were some scenes that that really stuck out and i i really like the professional relationships that he builds in this he's got he's definitely looking for guidance and mentorship to some extent or another to help further his his research and i just think that the relationships uh, in this are really strong from a professional standpoint even if all those people pretty much die yeah, th this film really works on a lot of levels and it has quite a bit of impact. And I was really impressed in just John Ford reinforcing why he's such a great technical filmmaker. And that really stood out in this. And his films that did have really stood out to me so far are the ones that he really elevates things with his filmmaking. And, you know, he taught Spielberg a thing or two about how to frame a shot. And you can tell it's quite impressive here. Also, one real quick shout out to Helen Hayes, who plays the wife, was 92 when she passed away and was continuing to act well into, like, she was Miss Marple in the Agatha Christie collection with, oh. like, Perot and everything. So, like, she had quite a career, even showing up in, like, little di uh, little films like this with Jodie Foster. Which is crazy. <laughs> so good for her. She had quite the career. Quite the spanning career. Yeah. For but sure. those are our thoughts on Aerosmith, which is quite a film, especially for early. And like this is 1931. This is the decade where young Mr. Lincoln and Stagecoach and Grapes of Wrath came out for John Ford. So we'll be I'll be getting to some big heavy hitters at that point. But this is an impressive film. Now, we have some recommendations for you. Mike, what would you like to recommend to everybody? In the spirit of Halloween, I will recommend The Walking Dead, colon, Daryl Dixon. And here's, here's why. So if you're a fan of The Walking Dead, there are few characters on the show that garnered as much, if, we, if he dies, we riot. And nobody embodied that more than Daryl, who... As a strong character on the show who grow, goes through a lot of great development and great growth as a character, but also for a character that's not even in the comic to stand out that much. Really? Is really oh, yeah. Daryl's not in the comic at all. So for, so for him to garner that much praise to get him a spinoff is really cool. And... I think one of the like I think one of the things about The Walking Dead that really kind of needed to happen is that we really needed to change a scenery where, hey, 
the rest of the world is dealing with this too, right? Or is this supposed to be emblematic of how U.S. capitalism has turned us all into zombies and now it's just all a matter of time before we, you know, we are consumed by it? No, everybody in the world is dealing with this too. So to see this in Paris, which how he gets to Paris and why he gets to Paris uh, is a bit sketchy to mm -hmm. say the least, but they're in Paris it feels like it feels like they asked Norman Reedus, like, hey, where do you want to film? And he throws a dartboard and is like, Paris it is. All right, cool. Yeah. But I just thought that it showed a didn't very interesting dynamic that you had don't get in the Walking Dead series set in America, because you have the the French who are trying their best to acclimate their lives and trying to do something different as opposed to what the Americans are doing, which they're always on guard. They're trying to get, they're trying to, they're fighting with rival factions and gangs and things like that. And the French, nope, they're trying to, they're trying to do other stuff. So I, I really liked it. If this is how the direction that the walking dead is going in, I'm all for it. It does kind of feel like at some point we got to get we got to be moving towards the end game for this. Um, and I feel like this one sets a very, very, very loose foundation for mm -hmm. that in a couple ways. But I don't know. I, I enjoyed it a lot more than I thought I was going to. As somebody who had never watched Walking Dead before, I enjoyed this quite a bit. That's good. Uh, Fun. Like underground zombie fights and the whole ideas of like religion and like the chosen one yes. and stuff like that was a very interesting take and then I have to make sure I give this actress the correct credit uh, Clemens Posey mm -hmm. who is the main French character in it Loved her. I thought she was great. Seeing her journey through all of this really added the layers of like how this is how other countries were dealing with this. Mm -hmm. And of course, they give a nice little tease at the end for all the fans of who they know they want Daryl to be connected with again. Mm -hmm. uh, and boy, did it leave on an interesting note. Didn't. Very much so. And yeah. big choices for Daryl. Didn't Negan get like a New York spinoff or something like that? He did. How's that one? I enjoyed it. The end got a little weird for me, but the city atmosphere presented a new feeling of danger that you don't really get from the the farmland or anything that has preceded that that spinoff but i don't know it was a lot of a lot of the same and i think the big thing that i liked about dead city was just the relation not the relationship but the companionship that maggie and negan had together considering their back history mm -hmm. yeah that had to be a little awkward but at the same time they always have really great interactions together, at least for the audience to see. It's got to be hell for Maggie to go through that interaction, but it's still good nonetheless. So that's definitely go. one worth checking out. Better than some of the other spinoffs that they've had before. Fear the Walking Dead, something the Walking Dead, there's all the Walking Dead. There's Walking Dead Worlds Beyond, which is about kids then there's tales of the walking dead which is a serialized version which i couldn't stand that and it took it took a lot of the th when when i wrote about tales of the walking dead i said that one of the things that i couldn't stand about it is that it's forcing you to get to know characters that you just met when you've got a whole cast of characters that you could you know, kind of focus a little bit more attention on. And they ended up doing that with Dead City and with Daryl Dixon. So there you go. Now, I have a couple recommendations. My new film that I wanted to recommend is Five Nights at Freddy's. Is it great? No. 
is it fun? I had fun. I've never played the games before, but you know, it's campy and funny and creepy. And there's one particular running jump scare gag that I, I had a ton of fun with. <laughs> Might be my favorite character in the movie. Oh, um, nice. There's some interesting choices in terms of like the backstory of uh, the janitor here, like the security guard here, security guard, and the inclusion of Matthew Lillard certainly is exciting mm -hmm. and how he gets incorporated in. There's creepy moments. There's some funny moments. I had a good time. You could watch it in theaters. You could watch it on Peacock. Mm -hmm. um, my watch list film is Halloween H20, 20 years later, which like this is like one of the few of any of these Halloween sequels that was like fine because <laughs> a lot of them are trash. A lot of them are pretty terrible. Mm, trash. I love trash. Mm, trash. Oh yeah, you haven't watched Brick and Morty. Morty's got the <laughs> uh, mm, Trash. Um, this one, I love that they brought Jamie Lee Curtis back. Uh, it has some interesting young actors like Josh Hartnett, Michelle Williams, and J uh, JGL are all in this. They even had Janet Lee pop up for a bit. And this one felt kind of felt like a Halloween movie again. Mm -hmm. Instead of it is sad this is the first one that um besides the third one that didn't have Loomis because Donald Pleasance had passed away around the time of the last film. But like this, this feels like one of the few ones that actually felt like a solid sequel. Mm -hmm. um, overall, though, th this franchise just kept jumping the shark and jumping the shark and jumping the shark. And how many times you could jump the shark? Um, and my last one from my own collection that I rewatched was The Worst Person in the World, which I have on Criterion Blu ray. Such an interesting and very not American look at relationships. And sometimes it's nice and refreshing to get a non-American perspective, a pet, especially on romance and relationships, because so many American films are so cliched and obnoxious about romance. And this is such an interesting film angered by such a talented young actress at the center and an interesting structure in terms of all of its chapters. So if you haven't checked that one out, definitely check it out. Mm -hmm. But that is a wrap here on Welcome to the Wasteland. Mike, thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for having me. Greatly appreciate it. Looking forward to coming back to talk more John Ford. Absolutely. And next week, be joined by Foster for Airmail. And Mike will be back. It'll be a while it, for, for John Ford, at least. Yeah, in a couple of months for Submarine Patrol. But for all of you out there, thank you so much. And thank you as always for tuning in and supporting your Wasteland Reviewer.